So this webinar is the second of a series that Pearson is presenting on assessment of memory. I'm Dr. Gail Roden, a clinical neuropsychologist working as an assessment consultant with Pearson Clinical Assessment. As an employee of Pearson Clinical Assessment, I have a financial interest in the topic of the webinar. I do not have any relevant non-financial information to disclose. Pearson Clinical Assessment is the publisher of most of the assessments that I'll reference during the presentation. This webinar describes the assessment process that allows us to understand why a young adult may be struggling with learning and remembering. At the end of the webinar, participants will be able to describe the process of learning and remembering, list three important factors that may contribute to memory problems in young adults, and identify which subtests from the new RAML 3 assess the components of memory that we've discussed. Our agenda today falls into three parts. First, I'll review the components of learning and memory. Those of you who attended a previous webinar given by my colleague, Dr. Gloria McCoo, will recognize some of these slides. But as a neuropsychologist, I'm going to take a bit of a deeper dive into some of the areas we cover. Then I'll turn to the clinical side of things, specifically areas you want to be sure to cover when interviewing college students and young adults who present with complaints related to memory. Finally, I'll give you a brief preview of the content of the RAML 3, Pearson's new measure that assesses memory and learning and associated cognitive skills in individuals ages 5 to 90. Let's start by thinking about memory. Do you see young adult clients who tell you they can't remember what they've read for class? who blank out during tests, even after having studied, who are suddenly struggling academically in the college environment, who report trouble learning specific course material, maybe math or history or chemistry, or outside the classroom are having lapses in memory for their own behavior. These are some common complaints from college students and ones we'll address in today's webinar. Let's start by looking theoretically at the process of learning and remembering. The term memory has been conceptualized and used in many different ways. The concepts of learning and memory are closely linked because memory is the natural outcome of learning. Back in 1987, Dr. Larry Squire provided an excellent description of this relationship. Learning is the process of acquiring new information, while memory refers to the persistence of learning in a state that can be revealed at a later time. In other words, memory is the indicator that learning has previously occurred. To learn and remember information, an individual must first encode or register the information. They must hold the information in short-term memory until a permanent memory trace is created in long-term memory. To show that they've acquired skills and knowledge, they must retrieve information from long-term storage. Learning, as used here, is more general than is applied to the concept of learning disability, as it's not limited to the acquisition of new academic skills. And memory, as used here, is a more technical term describing the particular forms of acquisition and retrieval. So memory is the ability to encode, store, and recall information. The three main processes involved in human memory are therefore encoding, consolidation and storage, and recall or retrieval. The process by which external information is transformed into mental representations or memories is referred to as encoding. Consolidation refers to the biological processes that solidify information from immediate memory into long-term memory stores. 
Note that encoding or the registration of information through the senses does not ensure retention. We forget most of what we register or encode within 48 hours. In order for retention to occur, we need to activate consolidation and storage processes. We need to review the encoded information so that it's copied into working memory and further processed in the hippocampus. During REM sleep, which we'll talk more about in a bit, memories are replayed and reinforced in the hippocampus. Research suggests that the waking brain is optimized for the encoding of memories, while sleep is a brain state optimized for memory consolidation and storage. We'll have more to say about this in a moment when we look at sleep as an important factor to consider when evaluating memory complaints. Finally, the process of bringing previously stored information into conscious awareness is retrieval. Note that memory problems can occur within any of these processes. Here's another slightly more detailed way to conceptualize the steps in learning and memory. While I won't review it in detail, I want to stress that a comprehensive memory measure should enable us to assess these areas, that is, to differentiate at which step or steps a breakdown is occurring that causes a deficit in memory. Let's also look briefly at why we forget. There are two simple answers to this question. First, the memory may have disappeared. It's no longer available. This is a problem with our short-term memory, which has a limited capacity and cannot hold on to information for more than 15 to 30 seconds without rehearsal. So the memory trace may either simply fade away or it may be displaced when additional information enters in. Either way, we've had a failure of encoding. Information did not get properly encoded, so it can't be consolidated or stored. In the second type of forgetting, the memory has been stored in the memory system, but for some reason can't be retrieved. This is forgetting in long-term memory, and it can be the result of a number of factors. Proactive interference occurs when you cannot learn new information because old, previously learned information interferes with what you're currently learning. That is, old memories disrupt new memories. Retroactive interference occurs when you forget previously learned information due to the learning of new information. In other words, later learning interferes with earlier learning. New memories disrupt old memories. And retrieval failure is just what it sounds like, where information is in long-term memory but can't be accessed because retrieval cues are not present. When we store a new memory, we also store information about the situation in which it was learned, as well as associations to previous learning, which serve as retrieval cues when we go to remember it. Again, a good test of memory will allow us to probe to determine whether any of these factors are interfering with learning and memory. Here's a quick rundown of how we differentiate some ways in which memory can break down. The examples I'm going to show you should remind you of the California Verbal Learning Test, the CBLT3 and CBLTC, which are among my favorite all-time tests. In a list learning task, like the CBLT, we can look for the effects of proactive and retroactive interference by introducing a second word list, list B, then again asking for memory of the original list, list A, and comparing performance on the various trials. Then we can determine whether a problem with recalling the items on the list was with encoding and storage or with retrieval by first requiring free recall of the words on the list. And then for any words not recalled, we try providing a cue. And if that doesn't prompt recall, using a recognition format 
to spur recall. Before we move on to topics specific to college students, a couple more distinctions that are important to make. One is between encoding and retrieval of auditory and verbal material versus visual or nonverbal material. We want a memory measure that will provide us with information about both types. Also very important are the different types of long-term memory. We start, we start, excuse me, by differentiating between explicit or declarative memory and implicit or non-declarative memory. Declarative memory refers to knowledge that we have conscious access to and can be further subdivided into episodic memory, which is our autobiographical memories, and semantic memory, which is our knowledge of basic facts. The major tests of learning and memory focus on semantic memory. Episodic or autobiographical memory is difficult to measure because it's personal and lacks objective verification, but it can be informally assessed using a clinical interview and verified by a third party. Non-declarative memory refers to knowledge that we have no conscious access to, typically procedural knowledge or skills, such as riding a bike or keyboarding. Assessment of procedural memory requires questioning in a clinical interview and or direct observation. This slide is here to remind us that learning and memory don't take place in a vacuum, but rather are embedded in a complex web of integrated cognitive processes. We collect information through our senses and we attend to this sensory information in order for registration to occur. The type of information we collect and process is language-based and or visual spatial. That is, we think in language and in images. And executive functions are the command and controls for the other cognitive processes. Speed and efficiency of cognitive processing cut across all of these processes. The one crucial component I've yet to mention is working memory. It's tempting to think of working memory as simply short-term memory, but it's actually a mix of short-term memory and executive functioning. It's a limited capacity memory system in which information that's the immediate focus of attention can be temporarily held and manipulated. It's the term manipulated or transformed that's key. Working memory is a workspace where information is worked on in order to facilitate goal-oriented behavior, including learning and remembering. As a simple example, it's where we do the mental math to calculate the amount of a tip to leave on a restaurant bill. Working memory is absolutely key to learning and memory because it's where the brain brings together facts and procedures from without, that is from our senses, and from within, from long-term memory. It's where we make those associations that help us lay down solid long-term memories. You can think of it as the gateway into and out of long-term memory. In the interest of time, I won't go into detail, but it's important to note that there are separate working memory areas devoted to verbal and visual information, as well as a central executive that integrates and processes this material. Additionally, the episodic buffer combines information from these components into a single representation for storage. Again, we want a comprehensive measure of learning and memory to provide us with a way to assess both verbal and nonverbal working memory. I keep alluding to formal assessment of memory using standardized assessment instruments, but a good evaluation always begins with a comprehensive clinical interview. When college students complain of memory problems, there are a host of areas that it's important to cover in the interview because college life 
is full of things that can interfere with learning and memory. Let's look at some of them. First and foremost, I ask about sleep habits, both the quantity and quality of sleep, since a lack of enough quality sleep is a common cause of memory problems in young adults. It's recommended that college students get seven to nine hours of sleep per night and that they keep the same sleep schedule throughout the week, even on weekends. As noted here, even a slight decrease in the amount of sleep, if it becomes habitual, can cause as much impairment in learning and memory as two all-nighters in a row. Those of us who are used to working with older adults need to reorient the factors we ask about that are likely to interfere with sleep quality. Believe it or not, as I've noted here, studies show that even the choice of a major can have a detrimental effect on sleep quality, although that's not likely to be something that we can change for our clients. The major factors likely to affect sleep quality in young adults are substance use, most commonly alcohol and or marijuana, excuse me, as well as caffeine, time spent on digital devices, and interference from noise and light. Let's talk first about caffeine, which is the most commonly used addictive substance at all ages. In addition to coffee, tea, and caffeinated sodas, it's important to ask about energy drinks. These vary in caffeine amount, with many having two to three times as much caffeine as an eight ounce cup of coffee. And the quarter life of caffeine is long, about 12 hours, meaning that if you have a cup of coffee or an energy drink at noon, 25% of the caffeine in it is still circulating in your brain when you go to bed at midnight. And obviously, consuming caffeine later in the day, especially in the evening to stay awake and alert for studying, leads to a much heavier load at bedtime. The problem is that caffeine has been shown to interfere with non-REM deep sleep, the part of our sleep most closely associated with memory consolidation. Now, based on what we learned in grad school, many of us tend to think of caffeine as enhancing cognitive performance. And in fact, a long history of studies showed that it did improve attention, alertness, vigilance, processing speed, learning, and memory. However, it took a while to realize that the majority of these studies used control groups that were also made up of caffeine users who were actually experiencing some degree of withdrawal during the studies. When both groups are given a one to two week washout period before testing, the effects of caffeine are significantly attenuated, although not completely removed. In fact, a leading sleep expert at Harvard Medical School has said, most of the caffeine consumed today is being used to compensate for the lousy sleep that caffeine causes. So clearly, it's a vicious cycle that many students find themselves in. Morning is the time when most people with a significant addiction to caffeine feel the effects of withdrawal. Brain fog is the most common morning cognitive complaint with irritability and headache following if caffeine isn't quickly consumed. For clients who describe this pattern, it may be helpful to explain the circular trap of caffeine consumption and discuss the possibility of a trial of going caffeine free, perhaps over a vacation period. While there are withdrawal symptoms, they're relatively mild compared to withdrawal from other substances and often last only a few days. Warn clients that they'll feel worse before they'll feel better, but a caffeine free life is not only good for sleep and good for memory, but these days can also save you a good deal of money. Next, let's talk about the effects of alcohol on sleep. While we often think about alcohol as lowering inhibitions and increasing sociability, it's actually a strong central nervous system depressant that slows down brain activity and acts as a sedative. 
Research has shown that sleepers who drink large amounts of alcohol before going to bed are often prone to delayed sleep onset, meaning they need more time to fall asleep. As liver enzymes metabolize the alcohol during the night and their blood alcohol level decreases, these individuals are also more likely to experience sleep disruptions and decreases in sleep quality. Unlike caffeine, which interferes with non-REM deep sleep, alcohol primarily affects REM sleep when we dream, especially during the earlier parts of the night. REM sleep is also important to memory consolidation and is especially critical to procedural memory and to declarative memories that are complex and or emotionally charged. Now we know that binge drinking is particularly detrimental to sleep quality. A very large study of college students done just last year looked at a number of factors related to physical and mental health. It asked about binge drinking, defining a drink, as you see here. It defined binge drinking as four drinks in a row for female students, five for male students, and four or five for transgender or gender nonconforming students. And it asked how many times in the past two weeks students who drank alcohol had engaged in such behavior. As you can see, fully a quarter had done so once and nearly 60% at least once, with some students reporting as many as 10 instances in a two week period. Pretty scary stuff. Marijuana, we're going to look at both indirect effects via sleep reduction and direct effects on cognition. In the same large study of college students, 20% reported having smoked marijuana in the past 30 days, which is arguably less than during the Jurassic period when I went to college, but is still a sizable proportion. Remember that earlier we noted that encoding occurs during waking states, while memory consolidation appears to be a function of the sleeping brain. Specifically, consolidation involves reactivation of recently encoded memory representations and integrating them into long-term memory. This occurs during slow wave sleep, while ensuing REM sleep appears to stabilize these transformed memories and wipe the slate clean for later new learning. Marijuana affects sleep cycles in multiple ways. Specifically, it's been shown to lengthen the early, light, non-REM stages of sleep, increase deep, non-REM, slow-wave sleep, and reduce the amount of REM sleep when dreaming occurs. Most of these changes are detrimental to sleep and its effects on memory, while the increased deep sleep may actually be helpful. So the jury is still out on the degree to which these changes in sleep architecture affect memory, although anecdotal reports suggest marijuana interferes with optimal consolidation and storage during sleep. Let's also touch on the direct effects of marijuana on cognitive processing, especially with chronic use. There's no question that THC, the active hallucinogenic component in marijuana interferes with hippocampal functioning. And we know the hippocampus is crucial to both encoding new learning and retrieving previously stored information. There's more controversy regarding the long-term effects of marijuana use with studies varying in terms of what they find in terms of changes in both brain volume and connectivity in key areas. However, my reading of the literature suggests it's very likely there are significant long-term changes, especially with regard to areas that result in a decline in verbal memory. It's worth noting that there's also a defined set of symptoms associated with marijuana withdrawal, which is something else to check when talking with college students. Brain fog, 
and sleep difficulty are among the chief complaints of individuals who abruptly stop consumption. So this is also a possible factor to consider. And before we leave the topic of substance use, let's focus for a moment on the use of prescription medications. A surprisingly large percentage of students in the 2020 study reported taking at least one and often several prescription psychotropic medications. Always ask about these and look up potential side effects that either directly interfere with learning and memory or may indirectly do so by affecting sleep. Moving away from substances, but staying with factors that can adversely affect sleep, we come to screen time on digital devices. We know that staring at screens, particularly in the evening, has been shown to be detrimental to sleep. This occurs due to a suppression of naturally occurring melatonin, which disrupts the circadian rhythm. Of course, the recommendation is not to use devices in the evening, especially close to bedtime, but how do you make this a reality with college students who use their devices for everything, both academic and social? Perhaps the best we can do is suggest they set their devices to switch to night mode in the evening, although there's little to no evidence that this helps reduce the effects on melatonin. Finally, as we look at sleep disruptors, we turn to noise and light pollution. These two decrease melatonin levels and disrupt circadian rhythms. And like screen time, there's probably not much we can do to quiet down a dorm or a fraternity house. We can, however, suggest that students try sleeping with earplugs, a sleep mask, or try a white noise machine to minimize the effects of noise and light. Let's um, turn away now from factors that largely influence memory indirectly via their effects on sleep and turn to some direct influences on memory functioning. What I'm here calling information overload is something I frankly hadn't given much thought to until I started researching to put together this webinar. I came across something that's been called the Google effect, which summarizes how extensive use of digital devices may have changed the way we think and learn, and probably not for the better. In short, the ability to rapidly access just about any type of information has greatly reduced the need to actually commit facts and even autobiographical information to memory. And interestingly, although information is generally easily found, we may be losing interest in accessing it if it takes too long to find it. There's research to suggest that there's a tendency to give up searching if more than three clicks are required. Keep that in mind next time you're looking for something on your phone. Perhaps even more alarming is reading research that shows we read differently from a digital device than if words are printed on paper. Specifically, screen reading encourages skimming, or what's called casual reading, rather than the attentive or deep reading we utilize with print. Think about how your eyes and brain work when you're scrolling through an article online or when you've used the search function to highlight relevant words. The research suggests we're covering more ground, that is, more words, but taking in less meaning, a sure route to impaired learning and memory. And in fact, researchers have warned that our functional memory capacity is actually declining due to screen reading. At Pearson, we have findings to bear that out. When we renormed the CVLT, a list learning task, in 2017, we saw a significant drop in the memory capacity of young adults on the first few trials of the learning portion of the test compared to their performance on the CVLT2, which was published 17 years earlier. Happily, it appears that they eventually reached the same overall level of memory performance, but they clearly are not as willing 
or able to take in information quickly as they were a generation ago. Another area I'm always careful to assess is whether a college student may have ADHD or a learning disability that previously went undiagnosed. Or perhaps it was diagnosed when they were younger, but they were told it had gone away as they got older. This is especially likely with bright students and with those who've been provided with strong supports or accommodations along the way. With the increased demands and reduced supports at the college level, these learning problems may reassert themselves, resulting in poor academic performance. I'll note that I used to see a fair number of struggling medical students in my practice and was surprised at how many of these obviously very bright individuals had gone through their entire K-12 careers without their ADHD or a learning disability having been picked up. Only with the heavy reading load and associated demands for memorization in medical school did these deficits become apparent. I'll just briefly note that the memory problems associated with ADHD appear to be largely due to encoding difficulties, that is with working memory deficits at the early stages of learning and memory. However, there's also some evidence of retrieval problems as well. Turning to learning disabilities and dyslexia in particular, working memory deficits are also common, affecting as many as half of dyslexic individuals. One key to look for in students with dyslexia as opposed to ADHD is that they may tell you that they remember much better when information is conveyed orally, for example, in lectures, rather than when they're required to read it. Now we know that depression is also a great disruptor of memory, particularly for recall of verbal information. Research suggests that there's a common underlying contributing factor to both mood symptoms and memory deficits in decreased volume of the hippocampus and increased cortisol levels. Turning again to the large 2020 study of college students, it's sobering to see that half of the students polled screened positive for depression and or anxiety. And 83%, 83% said their mental health had negatively impacted their academic performance over the past month. I absolutely recommend using a valid depression measure like the BDI-2 to screen all students with memory complaints for depressive symptoms. Another area I always question for is prior traumatic brain injuries, including concussions. TBI has a well-known detrimental effect on verbal learning and memory at both the encoding and retrieval stages. The more severe the injury, typically the more severe the cognitive effects. But minor brain injuries may have been ignored in terms of their effects on memory or on academic performance in general. In particular, multiple mild injuries, which young adults may have incurred playing contact sports, can have troubling cumulative effects. This takes us to the role of concussion, typically sports-related concussions. The typical sequela even of a single concussion are wide ranging and include problems with learning and remembering new information, while the ability to access previously learned information is generally largely spared. Because the cognitive effects can be subtle and the physical effects like headache or visual disturbances can resolve quickly, concussion has been described as a silent injury. For that reason, I always question young adults carefully about their history of participation in sports and any trauma, however mild, they may have incurred. Even if they didn't lose consciousness, did they ever experience a hit that made them see stars or feel dizzy? Did they subsequently experience a headache or brain fog? In particular, we know that soccer puts young female athletes especially at risk they're nearly twice as likely as their male counterparts to suffer concussions in this sport. 
Interestingly, male soccer players tend to be concussed due to player to player contact, while female players are more likely to be concussed by hitting the ball or coming in contact with a goal post or other piece of equipment. We also know that coaches or officials may be more attuned to noticing concussive impacts with male players, as they're more likely to be immediately removed from play after a hit. So a lot of concussions are likely going unnoticed in female players. Finally, I want to discuss a very recent trend that may bear attention, that is the effect of the internet, and more specifically of social media platforms like TikTok on young adults. We know that certain psychiatric diagnoses tend to trend on TikTok. Right now, ADHD and autism spectrum are popular, along with multiple personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and TLBs, which are tick-like behaviors that mimic Tourette's syndrome. To some extent, this trend can be seen as positive since it tends to reduce the stigma around mental illness and seeking help. However, many teens and young adults are getting a boatload of misinformation online, leading them to self-diagnose and sometimes even feign disorders for a number of reasons. This only adds to the importance of including measures of both symptom validity and performance validity when we assess young adults. Okay, I'm sure many of you may have questions about some of the areas we covered, but I'm gonna ask you to hold them for just a few moments while we have a word from our sponsor here about the new third edition of the Wide Range Assessment of Memory and Learning, RAML 3, which was published earlier this year. The RAML 3 is one of several learning and memory measures available through Pearson. I've already mentioned the CVLT3 several times, and we also have the TOMAL and the Wexler Memory Scale, with the RAML 3 being the latest and most up-to-date addition to our portfolio. It's a comprehensive measure. Here you're seeing the uh, areas covered under immediate memory. We talked earlier about distinguishing between problems with auditory verbal and visual nonverbal memory systems, looking at both immediate and delayed memory, and the importance of ancillary processes like attention and working memory. This slide and the next one show you that all of these are assessed by the RAML 3. Here we see the immediate memory components of the measure that include tasks that assess both verbal and visual memory as well as attention and concentration. Also notice that the RAML 3 includes a very brief screener that's ideal when time is limited and you want to determine whether a more comprehensive assessment is needed. This slide highlights the delayed memory components of the RAML 3. Notice that there are both recall and recognition tasks, each of which include both verbal and visual memory. And in addition, there are measures of both verbal and visual working memory. And remember that earlier we talked about the importance of distinguishing between problems with encoding, including follow-up consolidation and storage, and problems with retrieval. The RAML 3's brief form allows you to quickly determine where the problem lies by looking at immediate and delayed recall, as well as delayed recognition of both verbal and visual information. I also mentioned earlier the importance of incorporating measures of performance validity into our assessment of memory. Just as we expect symptom validity measures to be embedded in measures like the MMPI-3. The RAML-3 has just such an embedded measure of performance validity made up of the attention concentration index and the sum of the first five items across all four recognition subtests. This provides the examiner with quantitative information regarding the likelihood that an examinee is putting forth sufficient effort during testing. Before I wrap up and take questions, I want to alert you to the fact that there's one more webinar coming up in our series on memory. On December 1st, my colleague, Dr. Pat Moran, We'll be discussing the assessment of memory in private practice, and you can sign up online 
by going to our web page. That being said, I'm happy to take your questions. My colleague, Dr. Peter Entwistle, has been manning the Q&A and will join me for the remaining question and answer portion of our time. Pat, Peter, Pat may be there as well, Dr. Pat Moran, who I mentioned to you. What do you have for us? Thank you for asking, Gail. I'm going to encourage the audience to submit your questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, they've been largely quiet whilst you've been talking. There's a great oh, wow. deal of enthusiasm for what you've been saying, Absolutely. but I do encourage them to uh, submit a question, okay? Very good. We'll see, we'll see what we have. I'm going to um, come back well, on screen. Gail? So, Gail, there is one that did come up, which is... Uh, uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Including, uh, what's including in the battery of assessments you use for assessing ADHD and SLD in college students? And I think that might be a good one to answer live. Oh yeah, be happy to. So um, when I was in private practice, my practice was called the Center for Attention, Learning and Memory and the assessment of ADHD and SLD in older students, young adults was a big part of my practice. The heart and soul of an ADHD evaluation, and we'll start with ADHD, is gonna be taking a really solid clinical interview and a really thorough history. The first thing I always started with was requesting school records. And believe it or not, they're easy to get, even for older students, just have the student write to, or in these days, uh, email the high school from which they graduated let them know the year they graduated and the name under which they attended school and ask for copies of all of their records. And it's important to ask for both their cumulative file and their confidential file, because if they received any special ed services or section 504 services, those are gonna be in the cumulative or rather in the uh, confidential file. We wanna make sure we get those. So I always ask them ahead of time to get those and get them to me, either sign a release, give a release for them to come directly to me or for them to bring them in so I can review them ahead of time. Um, that really prepares me to do a good, deep clinical interview with them um, that includes all of that academic history as well as personal history. I then turn to questionnaires. I use a DSM-5 based questionnaire that you know, goes over um, all of the symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. Um, and I also use Barclay and Murphy's criteria for determining uh, what the cutoffs ought to be for those older age groups, as opposed to using just those in the DSM, which are based on uh, kids and younger adolescents. Then I, I use the Brown. And when I was practicing, I used the Brown ADD scales. Those have now been updated to the Brown Executive Function Attention Scales. I think they're wonderful. I would do those with the student and with, if they bring a parent or a significant other, I would collect data in an interview format using the Brown scales from both the student and from the significant other. Great conversation starter and I find it really gets to the heart of the matter. So those are largely what I do. Um, I, as I mentioned, I would also screen for depression and anxiety. The BBI too and the BAI are excellent for that. There are also other measures out there, some in the public domain that can help you with that. Now, the, the question becomes, what do I do in terms of performance-based measures? And the answer is, I don't do anything to diagnose ADHD. But I do it to rule out other things because I always say that ADHD is a very social disorder. That is, um, it rarely shows up alone. It likes to come along with friends. And one of those common friends is a learning disability, particularly language-based learning disabilities. So what I'm doing when I do an assessment, a performance assessment, is I'm looking to rule out anything else that may be interfering with learning and memory or with whatever complaints they have, excuse me, they have come in with. So I may, um, the first thing I'm gonna do, if I, now if I've diagnosed ADHD on the basis of the clinical interview, I'm gonna suggest that they, if they're interested in trying medication, that they uh, go see a physician to talk about whether that's appropriate. 
And if so, give it a good long try, let's say four weeks or so to really have an effect and get titrated. Because I don't wanna just see the effects of ADHD on the testing that we do. I wanna see what's left, what in addition to ADHD, like a learning disability or reading problem, may be interfering with their performance. So I wanna see them at peak performance with the ADHD symptoms under control. Um, I hope that's helpful for SLD, very similar to what I've told you up front. Um, in addition to that, these days, I would probably be using the um, dyslexia screen, the Shaywitz dyslexia screen that Pearson produces, which is really helpful in pinpointing adult dyslexia. And I would probably go a bit deeper with my um, performance testing in terms of uh, IQ, cognitive ability, perhaps a, a briefer measure or perhaps a longer measure, and then look more carefully at academic tasks um, just to, to really get a good, clear picture of where the breakdown is occurring. Gail? Yes. One of the questions that did come up um, was, um, how would you assess individuals in a post-COVID environment, in particular, uh, how would you assess memory, executive function, and attention? And I know you covered a lot of that already in your previous response, uh, but do you have any thoughts about this particular topic? I do. And I, and I, I you know, one of the reasons I included so many results from that, that um, Healthy Minds study is that it was done in 2020. So it was done during the pandemic when we were all, already seeing the effects um, uh, all kinds of effects on, on young people. And um, one of the things I think I would do at this point is very much like what we do when we're assessing for ADHD and we're looking to ascertain on, you know, was there a childhood onset? And that is, I think I might be likely to give some of these questionnaires and ask some of these questions. How are, how are you performing now? What's getting in your way? Now let's think back to 2018, 2019, okay? And what was the, was, were things any different then? So we can try to differentiate what may be stressors that have been added by the pandemic versus things that were more endemic to the student themselves and have, have followed them into this situation. Now that can be tricky because there may have been other changes in their life as well. They may have gone very well from high school to a college environment or from living at home to living on campus. So we need to try to tease some of that out. But I think what I would be doing is, is asking for some comparison. And I think that in, in most cases, young people that age are pretty good reporters of that. How have things changed for you in the past two years? So we're also getting some we'll get, um, uh, questions regarding kind of uh, interpretation and whatnot. Um, you know, one of them that came up was, again, the, the issue around malingering and uh, motivated college students to be able to uh, be identified as having a learning disability because of the accommodations and so on. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the various pressures that students are facing uh, to achieve at higher and higher levels and maybe past generations. Uh, is this something that we can, can tackle a little bit? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I, I know we, I was trained to use the word malingering. I try to stay away from it because I, I want to have respect for the fact that students are under such stress and that they may feel um, the need to, to you know, not give tests their all or to present symptoms that uh, as being more severe than they actually are. I see it as a cry for help. So uh, as I mentioned on the ramble, we have a, a symptom or, or a rather performance validity measure. Um, we can also do something like the TOM, the test of memory malingering. There's that M word again, um, to get at that type of thing. If we're giving an MMPI or an MCMI, um, those have built-in symptom validity measures. We want to take a careful look at the validity. And when I see those things uh, are, are high, I want to sit down and, and have a heart-to-heart -heart with students about why that might be and frame it with them as a sign of their distress and to try to understand better what that stress might be coming from and what we can do to help alleviate it um, and not 
rush off to, to um, provide a diagnosis, but ask what might be helpful in alleviating those things. Sometimes a diagnosis is required to get assistance, but many times there are um, supports on campus like tutoring centers and so forth that can be helpful or reducing one's course load and you know, taking an extra semester or two to graduate. Lots of things that can help um, without necessarily requiring uh, a diagnosis. And, and sometimes that helps clear the air a bit. What else, gentlemen? One of the questions that came up was about working memory and how prevalent that problem is in today's society. And do you have any suggestions for intervention or uh, ways to assess that? Yes. Um, so we have lots of measures of working memory, but I personally, I am just such a big fan of gathering real world information from my clients because what I really want to know is um, how is this affecting you in the real world? You may be able to come into my office and under controlled circumstances, read back a series of letters and numbers, reordering them. And you can, you can hold on and you can do that you know, for, for the five minutes it takes to do a, a digit symbol task or a, a digit span task. Um, but then in the real world, it, it's more than five minutes in somebody's office where students have to hold together. And students with ADHD and learning disabilities who have working memory problems are the ones who are telling me, um, I read a page in a textbook, I get to the end of the page and I have no idea what I've read. I know it went in, but I don't know where it went. It sure didn't go into my brain. So I rely a lot on, um, in particular, I would say on the Brown EFA scales, which has a, a a scale in there that looks at using working memory and accessing long-term storage. And I think the items on that measure are particularly well-written. And it's interesting because Dr. Brown, Tom Brown, who created those scales, his specialty is working with twice exceptional students, those who are gifted and have ADHD. Um, and so he's I think really perceptive about understanding how you can go a long way in school, be very bright, achieve, achieve well enough to get into a good college, to maybe even get into grad school. As I said, I saw plenty of med students with these problems and hold it together until things just get too overwhelming for you. And so the questions in there, I think are really super helpful um, in teasing out those working memory problems. So uh, this may be, I don't know if this is too deep of a dive, but um, can we comment on the, on the research or, uh, well, that basically shows with respect to the effects of proxical, proximal or distal uh, experiences of trauma, complex trauma on memory and how we assess for this mm -hmm. and college students, you know? A great question and, and something that I did not include. Um, I, I, I think... I don't wanna say I have doubts about trauma, but I think in the time since I have, you know, been practicing, I mean, I still maintain a small practice, but the, the time since I was seeing clients on a daily basis, we've broadened our definition of what constitutes trauma. And I think we've, we've greatly increased our awareness of the ongoing effects of trauma but I wonder if there's going to be a bit of a pendulum swing um, back from that, because I think these days we're, we're quick to question for trauma and we're quick to assume that it is a, a chief contributor to whatever is going on in someone's life. And again, I don't want to disrespect that for any individuals or for clinicians. But I think it may, in some cases, be one of those things where we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if we dig deep enough and we broaden our definition of trauma wide enough, um, I think we can always find precipitating events that we can link. So my, my, 
my recommendation is to be very careful, to question carefully and respectfully. But in many ways, I often leave it up to clients to share. I might ask, is there anything else in your history that we haven't talked about today that you think might be important in explaining your, the concerns that brought you here today? Um, and not be digging, digging, digging um, around that area. I, I recognize that that answer might be somewhat controversial, but you asked and I answered, and that, yeah. that's kind of where I come from. Can I add a piece to that, Dale? Yes. So I, I would alert folks to uh, become familiar with the research around what's described as the HCA axis, which is, uh, forgive me if I it's completely correct, but it's the it's the uh, hippocampal cortisol basically Hypo, hypo hypothalamus. hypothalamus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's this, it's this feedback axis that respond right. that affects the memory development systems that are often impacted by trauma and particularly complex trauma and so on. Um, but but if folks are dealing with the, uh, like a possible dissociative experience because of trauma, there are other measures on top of. Uh, on top of something like the ramble that you would give. The ramble would tell you what kind of functional things we're seeing that are impaired, but uh, I would alert folks to the, uh, the federal PTSD uh, basic warehouse, of, uh, resource warehouse um, that's on, uh, that the federal government runs. So mm -hmm. it's a PTSD resource center, I think it's called. And um, there's all kinds of uh, resources that are listed there for assessing kind of concurrent issues that would be seen from trauma. It would also be impacting memory. And Pat, I suspect you're going to cover that in more detail when you talk about assessing memory a little bit yeah. in private practice. All right. I think our time is just about up. Um, you're going to have the opportunity in the slide that comes up uh, at the end of this um, to uh, submit any additional questions that we didn't get to today. I thank you all for an hour of your time and I wish you a lovely week. Thank you.